Hello there and welcome to this News Desk special, Meet the Author. We're delighted to be joined by one of Ireland's most talented and creative children's writers and illustrators, Oshin McGann. Oshin, you're very welcome. Thanks, uh, would you tell the News Desk viewers about the wide range of books <coughs> that you write and illustrate, and in particular, your mad granddad stories? Um, well, I, I, and from the very start, I wanted to have a book ready for whatever level of reader was out there. So whatever age you reach, I wanted to have a book ready for you. Um, so I do a lot of different books, everything from first time readers up to novels for young adults or old adults. Um, uh, I don't care who you are, I want you to read my books. So I, I like a mix of different things. Is um, it difficult at sort of balancing them all when you have, you know, you're writing for such very different audiences? Uh, it is, but I mean, it's it's over. You know, publishing happens over a long period of time, so you get a lot of time to think about the differences between them and how to write one book as opposed to a different type. So, um, you know, I could easily be working on um, working on a uh, writing a novel, editing a different book, illustrating a third one. Um, so, you, you know, it, it it seems to be very kind of uh, mixed and varied, but actually, you're oh, you're spending long periods of time on one thing or another. So, when, when about in your life did you decide that you wanted to be an author and how did you make that happen? Um, I don't really remember a time when I didn't want to be an author. Um, I always say writer actually as opposed to author. Author is somebody who has written something and a writer writes. So um, I've been writing for as long as I could hold a crayon really. Um, and I just loved stories. So um, from the age that I could fill copybooks really, that's, that's when it started. Um, there was a point when I wanted to be a zoologist a few years when I thought you had to have a proper job. I, could, I didn't think this was a, a type of job that normal people had. Uh, so there was a few years when I said, yeah, I'll be a zoologist. And, and then that stopped. Um, and I was still writing stories and drawing pictures, so I really wasn't, I wasn't kind of copping myself on at all. Did you read a lot when you were at school? Yeah, I was a huge reader. I was one of those who always had a book in my hand or was always reading. And um, anything, really, I'd read anything. Um, I would have read... Uh, Enid Blyton or Professor Brainstorm or Roald Dahl or Narnia or any kind of crime or mystery story or Lord of the Rings or it didn't matter. I'd, I'd try anything. And when did sort of being a fan of reading become sort of a fan of writing and having a go at writing? Was that at school or is that something that developed? Um, I think, it? no, like I said, it would have started very early, but I think there was a time in primary school, kind of fifth and sixth class, so I was about um, 10, 11, 12, when I really started to think, oh, you know, maybe I should make a go of this. Um, but then I went through secondary school and it kind of, it was more essays in secondary school, so you kind of write less creatively, I think. Um, and on into, I think even, I got to my early 20s before I actually wrote something I would try and get published. Um, and uh, at that point I'd worked, for instance, I, I, uh, I had worked as a, or had started working as, a, as an art director and a copywriter in advertising, so I'd done professional writing. Um, but no, there, there was no, there was no one point when I thought this is the what I'm going to do. Um, for a while, it was going to be comics. I thought I want to be a writer and an artist in comics. Um, but I can't remember a single point where I said, "This is it. I'm committing to it." I think um, it was always there. It was always kind of in my head. I never really felt like I had a choice. You know? um, so. I think maybe there was in third year, so the GCSE level, when, when I thought I'd like to be a professional artist. I think that was, that was a time when I thought I could do this for, that for a living and then maybe get into writing. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, it's always been there. It's kind of been ever present. Look, I, I am sure the, the news desk viewers would love to hear part of your story. Could you read a sort of section from one of the, yeah, the Mad sure. Grandad books first, please? So this is the first Mad Grandad book I wrote, um, but they're coming out with new covers now uh, and being re-released. So I'm going to read the first part of this book. Um, and this is Mad Grandad's Flying Saucer. <coughs> I was having tea and biscuits at Grandad's house when he saw the strange advert in the newspaper. Lenny, look at this, he said. There in the paper was a small ad. It read like this. Flying, sa flying saucer for sale. Good as new. One careful owner. Wow, I said, imagining myself as an astronaut. Can we go and have a look at it, Grandad? I don't see why not, lad, he replied. I've always wanted my own flying saucer. Grandad wasn't like other grown-ups. Mum and Dad said he was a bit mad. He sometimes heard voices or saw things that weren't really there. But he did stuff no other grown-up would do. Mum and Dad would never have taken me to look at a flying saucer. We jumped on a bus and went to the address in the advert. We walked up the path to the front door. 
There were lights all over the front of the house and the walls were painted silver. Grandad rang the bell and the door opened. There, standing right in front of us, was an alien. She was no lady, but an alien all the same. Normal old ladies don't have blue skin and loads of eyes that go all the way round their head. Ah, you'll be here about the spaceship, she said. I'm Mrs. Vamox. Would you like some tea? We went out into the back garden while she put on the kettle. And there it was, as real as you or me, a big, round, shiny flying saucer. I've decided to stay on this planet because it's nice and quiet, Mrs. Vamok said when she brought out the tea, so I won't be needing my ship anymore. What do you think of it? I couldn't speak. I was too gobsmacked. Grandad gave me a look. We think it's great, he said. How much do you want for it? And that was how we bought a spaceship. Mrs. Vamok showed us how to work the controls and then we climbed into the seats and the glass dome closed over our heads. We took off and shot up into the sky. Let's go into space, said Grandad. OK, I said. He pointed the spaceship straight up and kept going until all we could see were stars. Wow, I gasped. Look at all that. Grandad slowed down and stopped. We turned around and looked down at the Earth, a big blue ball below us. All sorts of weird satellites flew past us, spinning around the planet. I should have brought a camera, I said. You can always bring it next time, Grandad told me, but we need to go now. Your mother will think I've got lost in the city again. She'll be worried about you. We'll come again next weekend and have a picnic and everything. He was just starting the flying saucer up again when a big, mean-looking spaceship flew down in front of us. A stumpy alien sat inside. He had holes all over his face and hands and was dressed in a uniform that was much too big for him. Not allowed to park here, he called out. Not without paying. Why should we pay to park here? I shouted back. We're out in space. Oh, this isn't just any old space, the alien shook his head. This is parking space and I'm a parking guard and you haven't paid up. Do you know what happens to people who park without paying? No, I said, and then wished I hadn't. They get clamped, the parking guard said, smiling. He pushed a button on his control panel. Suddenly, a big yellow metal thing was fired from a hatch in his spaceship. It shot over to our flying saucer and stuck with a loud clang. Grandad tried the controls. The clamp was holding the spaceship in place. Lenny, we can't move, he cried. Oh, you'll move all right, the parking guard sneered. The collectors are on their way. They'll take away that nice shiny spaceship and you'll be walking home. But how we walk back to Earth, they yelled. We'll fall and kill ourselves. It's not my job to deal with complaints, the parking guard said. Right to the complaints officer. I'm off. I don't like running into those collectors. They're a nasty lot. He started his rockets and turned his ship around. In a flash, he was gone and we were left alone, stuck out in space. At this Brilliant. Who wouldn't love to have a granddad that would buy them a flying saucer? Absolutely, yep. <laughs> it's just like every child's yeah, dream. <laughs> wouldn't we all? Where, where did you come up with the character Mad Granddad? Uh, well, I, I actually went into a Brian Press looking for illustration work. I'd written my first two novels, but I, I didn't pitch the novels to them at the start. And um, I was working as an illustrator and I was looking for work all over the place, um, as you do, you're working freelance. And uh, they liked one of the styles that I worked in, but they didn't have any books for me to illustrate at the time. They were looking for, um, illustrate, looking for writers for a series of uh, what they called the Flyers. Um, and I said, well, look, I write a bit, so give me, give me a crack at it. And I wrote three books and they liked two of them, the first two Mad Grand books. Um, and that was how we started off. So the granddad, I mean, writing for that age, you have to have a kid that age, but also a kid that age can't do, there's certain things they can't do. They can't get in the bus and go into town. There's all sorts of restrictions to what they can do. So I thought, what if, if you had an adult, that means they could pretty much go anywhere, but if you have a responsible adult, a sensible one, well then it's gonna keep them out of trouble. And where's the fun in that? So it had to be a slightly irresponsible adult. And I thought, well, actually having an irresponsible mum or dad, that might be a little bit dodgy so but whereas grandparents well grandparents are a bit mad you know um i mean most people think their granddad is a little bit mad so i thought well actually that's the way to go so let's give him a, make him a little bit madder than usual um and then i looked around I, I thought of some of the old men i've known in my life and i mixed a few bits of them together um and that's where my granddad came from Brilliant. Well, listen, it, it certainly works. And um, I mean, not only does Oshin write these great stories, but he's also so talented that he illustrates them as well. Uh, it is, it, I mean, is it easier to illustrate a character that you have written yourself or is it easier to do sort of somebody else? Uh, well, yeah, I think w when I write, I, I would have, I would visualize the character. I mean, I would tend to write things that I'm seeing in my head. Um, so there is that. It's... Um, I mean, it was always the intention. I always 
I, I always drew with the intention of illustrating stories. That's what that's what the art was for for me. Um, but I've written, I've illustrated. I mean, when when I first did the Mad Granda books, I'd illustrated over forty books for other people. Um, so that was my job. I was well used to that. So when it came to doing my own books, I had a process that that I, I went through. Um, and it was very easy then because I had this thing in my head. I knew what I wanted to do, and I had done so many books before that illustrate my own book was was pretty straightforward. Um, but it was great. It was also a great opportunity to get to do it, um, and it was a dream come true to kind of write and illustrate a book. You know, um, so uh, but that grounding had been there for a long time. That kind of that trade as an illustrator. Can we ask you to give us something of a demonstration, just so you can yep. show the, the news desk viewers sort of her sitting in school, wh how you go about creating, a, you know, a, a character for one of your books? Sure. Yep. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, well, when I start off, I always start off. I know quite often when you see people draw on telly, you see them draw the marker and they don't make any mistakes, and it looks a little bit like a magic trick. You can't figure out how they did it. Um, and I, as a kid. I always found that frustrating that I could never draw properly first time. And I didn't realize that actually there's a, there's a whole sketchy bit, a rough bit that comes before that. So what I'm gonna start off doing is start off drawing with a pencil and I draw lightly. And I'm not worried about making mistakes. I'm not worried about getting all the details right at the first, at the first time. So I'm gonna draw the rough shape very, very sketchily. And this is a bit that we don't see enough, I think, on the, on the telly when you see people drawing. It makes it look, uh, you know, you need to see the very rough sketch of it at the start. So you can see this is very quite scribbly. I'm not trying to be neat at all. Um, but in the finished illustrations, you wouldn't see this. This doesn't make it through. Now, even from this bit here, I know some really important things about this drawing. I know what size it is. I know what shape it is, and I know where it is on the page. And this is called composition. This is where I, I'm planning the, the drawing out. So all the bits that I will add to this now, I know where they're supposed to go, and I know they're, they'll be in the right place. And that way you don't have this thing where you draw a really good head, really good neck, really good shoulders, really good chest, really good tummy, really good legs. You get down to the bottom and you haven't left room for the feet. Um, so this way I know where everything's going to go. I've worked out the positions of things, and now I can start drawing in features, like the glasses. So. We're going to have Mad Granted here, and this is how he always starts off. Um, and I always start off with a pencil, like I said. And then I'll do the mark in a bit. Now, if I was doing this for a book, I would, um, I would use an old-fashioned, what we call a dip pen. It's a type of pen you still have to dip in a bottle of ink. Um, and that's why I get the kind of the scratchy style that I use for Mad Granted. So it's almost a bit like writing as well. I mean, you wouldn't start off to write a story without knowing where you were going, you know, what was going to happen with it. So when you're, you're doing your drawings, you're, you're making your, your, your rough outlines, your guidelines before you would start to sort of, you know, work on the detail. Yeah, so the, I mean, there are some people who can write and they just need to get some stuff down on the page. But what you find is if they, if they do that first, if they write first and then think about it, and then think about planning, what they end up doing is rewriting a lot. Um, I would plan first and then, so we all, we, we do it slightly different ways, but this way with, with drawing, drawing is like building something. So this is quite a simple picture. There's only one person in it, but if I was drawing a city or a machine or um, a crowd, you can't just start at one side and work your way through to the other, drawing everything and finished. You have to work out the bits first. So. Granddad, I mean, I can draw Granddad straight on with a marker. That's, that's not a problem. I've been drawing him for years. Um, but that's not my process. That's not how I go about doing it. My first thing is to sketch it out and work out where all the bits are going to go. So now I'm going to use a marker. <coughs> if I was doing this for a book, I'd make him more finished as, with the pencil first. But um, I'm going to use the marker now because we have to do it quite quickly. Um, and... As you can see, it's, it's almost like drawing them twice. And actually, if I was doing a complicated picture, I'd do three versions. I'd do a really, really rough sketch, very small, called a thumbnail sketch. Um, and then I'd do the pencil, and then I'd do the ink. Or if you're painting, you, you, um, you do a, a neat line onto painting paper, and then you paint over that. Um, but you'll never see the sketchy bit in the books, because what we do 
we cheat. Um, we put the clean line, I have a I light desk, so I shine light through the paper and I'll trace a perfectly clean line onto a new sheet of paper. So you never get to see the sketchy bit. And that was a bit that drove me nuts when I was a kid, because I didn't know that. Um, I thought they started, that pen and marker starting to run out. I thought they started with a clean line. I thought that was how they did it from the scratch. And of course, sometimes when you see people do it, that's how they draw. But it's taken them years to be able to draw like that. Um, and they also rehearse the drawing. They know they can do it in one go. So this is really kind of quick version of Mad Grandad. And Mad Grandad, as you notice, his eyebrows are up above his head. He's one of the few people you'll ever see where you can see his eyebrows from behind. And he's got this big nose. Kids sometimes laugh at the big nose, but of course, you see, when they get older, they'll have big noses too. Your body stops growing and your nose keeps going and your ears sometimes as well. Um, and is that part of the secret of, of doing a caricature is to take, you know, one or two features and exaggerate them slightly? Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that we use illustrations more than photographs for stories, um, because you could photograph a whole thing, you know, you could set it up, but art, it doesn't just show you what's there, it gives you a feel for it. So we say, well, actually, let's imagine, let's really go for this nose, let's imagine a really big nose, it's really big square glasses. Um, it's, uh, again, for one of the reasons that we do big heads on characters is so you can see the expression better on the face. All of these things, and these are, these are things that artists learn along the way. You know, some people think that some people can draw and others can't. But it's technique. We learn these things. We practice them. And we learn all the tricks, like tracing through the paper and hiding that sketchy line. Illustrators learn all these tricks. And it's like any other skill. It's like riding a bike or playing a musical instrument or working a computer. We work these things out. Um, so we work out, you know, how do you draw hands? How do you draw faces? The folds in clothing, all these things. We have to, we have to practice them. So do you reckon that anyone, I mean, whatever pupils watching here, uh, if they think they can't draw, do you think anyone can learn to draw? Oh, absolutely. Um, I wasn't the best artist in my class when I was in primary school. And I still, when I went to do art in secondary school, I still wasn't the best artist in my class. Um, but I was the one that kept at it. Um, and I, I loved it. And I kept doing it. And eventually, I ended up making a living from it. And I think I was probably the only one in primary or secondary school who ended up making a living, you know, in my class, who ended up making a living from it, even though there were other people who started off better than I was, because I practiced. And I did, I drew what was fun to draw, so I did a lot. And when you do something a lot, you do, you get better at it. Um, so for here's for the shoes, what I'm gonna do, a really simple trick. If you wanna make something look shiny, put a little bit of white on top, a little highlight like that, and do the rest in dark. So again, really simple tricks that we use. And we learn these. You kind of watch other people do it. I, I, I got a lot of books on drawing, trying to figure out how to do it. I watched people who were much better than me. Um, and uh, so little things like, how do you draw the, you know, how do you draw the, the wrinkles in clothing? All these things I had to figure out. Or, um, and doing, uh, doing it in art college helps, um, learning off good teachers, but really it's about practice. So I'm going to use a smaller marker, and this is just kind of add some little bits here and there. Why is it it's only grandparents wear braces? I, yeah, I don't know even why I gave him braces. He just it was a character thing at the time I thought looked looked interesting. But actually, I did, even my granddad didn't wear braces. He was, <laughs> um, it's one of those things. I think one of the things about being an illustrator as well is you tend to, you tend to draw the things that, um, when you're doing a children's book, you tend to draw things that you associated with, for instance, for old people when you were a kid. Um, and uh, you know, by the time actually I was, I was growing up, people weren't wearing braces anymore, but it just seemed to be the right thing to do. I think as well, I, I knew there was one guy I knew, he was very old and he, he'd worn braces and his trousers were slow, he was slowly sinking into his trousers, they were getting higher and higher up, and a belt just wasn't going to do it anymore. He had to have the, he had to have the braces. So I think there was probably some of that in it as well. So he's a bit bristly, his granddad. He's lost the hair on his head, but he's coming out everywhere else. Um, and he's got hairy arms. 
And then sometimes just a few of these things. I like the, the Mad Grand illustrations have this kind of slightly rough edge that I like I'm kind of adding these little bits here and there. And then wrinkles on the head, on the foot, on the mouth, sorry. And, um, and then what we can do, just for a little bit of background, this can be a bit of grass or a bit of bush behind him. He knows how the, the ground behind his legs, not under his feet. So it looks like there's a bit more behind him. And that helps him. Yeah, it kind of helps. He's coming forward. Yeah, it pushes him forward a bit and it, it kind of puts his feet on the ground and gives us a little bit of staging. Sometimes you just want a little bit of background to make him look a bit more just so he's not floating on the page. That's um, fantastic. Okay. So. Like all good artists, has to be so. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, that's Mad Grandad. I always draw, tilt him over a little bit to the side when I'm drawing um, from the side. Actually, I'm gonna fiddle now. This is... Round those up a bit. Eyes are important. Um, yeah, so that's that's Mad Grand. That is fantastic. Thank you very, very much indeed. That's very impressive in such a short space of time. Um, listen, Oshin and I are going to set you a challenge. Uh, we've heard today about Mad Grandad, and we've seen how Oshin illustrates his characters. So we want you to create a new character based on a family member or a job, such as my amazing aunt or the hungry headmaster, then do a drawing of your character with their name at the top of the page and your name and school at the bottom of the page. Ask your teacher to take a photograph of your character and send it in to the news desk at c2kni.org.uk or use the contact us link at the bottom of the news desk home page. You have one week from today and the three most original characters will receive copies of Oshin's books as prizes. And if Oshin's all right with us, we may even throw in yeah, this, absolutely. this signed uh, Mad Grandad picture as well for, for what Oshin considers to be the most original one out of them all. So look, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, Oshin, thank you very, very much thank for joining us. For it, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you for watching. I uh, hope you've enjoyed meeting the author. Until the next time, bye-bye.